So today's webinar, as all of them, is sponsored by Goodwin University's Institute for Learning Innovation, the Goodwin University Center for Teaching Excellence, and the University of Bridgeport Center for Excellence in Learning and Teaching. We, the University of Bridgeport and Goodwin University are partners uh, at the enterprise level, and we're excited to be bringing this institute, uh, institute this webinar to you today. At Goodwin, Un Universal Design for Learning is our special expertise. We provide long-term job embedded professional learning to um, universities, uh, not just at Goodwin and, and the University of Bridgeport, but at other universities around the country. And we're really excited to be doing that. Please keep your mics muted. We'll be monitoring the chat to ensure that we can um, catch your questions. Uh, we will post some links to the chat. Um, in particular, the links and information about all the sessions is in Padlet. So we'll make sure that link gets up there. We'll be putting in copies of today's. Um... Oh, here we go. And such... OK, I'm reading the chat. Sorry, I just got distracted. All right, I apologize for that. Uh, we'll also be putting in copies of the um, today's slide. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our speakers today. Really excited to have them here with us. Uh, we have, oops, let's see, there we go. We have Angela Matiga, who is the Associate Director for Graduate Advising, Graduate School of Professional Accounting, Northeastern University, Demora McKim School of Business. That's a mouthful. Yep. And Angela is an educator and an advisor who's been supporting undergraduate and graduate students for over 20 years. Currently, Angela oversees career and academic advising and leads student success initiatives at the graduate school. Uh, and you can learn more about her on LinkedIn. We also have with us today, Julie Stanwood, and she is an educator, administrator, and counselor with over 30 years of experience in higher education. She's also a qualified administrator for Intercultural Developmental Inventory and Restorative Justice Practitioner. She's passionate about culturally responsive, inclusive educational frameworks and aspires to advocate for college students of all identities and abilities uh, to access the right to learn. You can also connect with her on LinkedIn. We're very excited to have both of you here today. So hello, everybody, and welcome to our session. Today, we are here to talk about UDL guideline three, provide options for comprehension. And we're presenting this guideline through the lens of making learning accessible. And we are going to focus on college students today because we both work in higher education. To give you an idea of what we're gonna talk about today, our agenda includes some introductions. We'll review the principle and the checkpoints. We're gonna take you on a little tour of a course called Visual Culture Seminar, and we'll approach comprehension through a course syllabus. We'll think about some questions and discuss some strategies to optimize learning in this specific learning environment. As Diana mentioned, uh, my name is Julie Stanwood, and I've been employed in higher education roles for the past 30 years. Um, my Current leadership role holds responsibility for undergraduate advising and mentoring at Lesley University College of Art and Design. Um, also a an adjunct faculty member in the psychology department at Lesley University. My colleague Angela and I work together in developing the first year experience program and have worked extensively with first year students. Um, and we are not by any means UDL experts. Um, we like to refer to ourselves as UDL enthusiasts. So now I'm going to pass it over to Angela. Yep. So I'm Angela. Um, lucky enough to have spent quite a bit of my career working with Juliet Leslie, certainly partners in crime uh, when it came to the advising piece there. But just want to share that. Today, we're going to be thinking through some visual arts and education. And in addition to my role as an advisor, I've also uh, been teaching visual arts courses for a number of years. I have a background in photography and video. And another note is my first exposure to UDL came really early on in my career, where I kind of snuck my way into a workshop that um, one of our education programs was putting on. 
And I learned about this idea of checklists and I have been a fangirl of UDL ever since. So great to be here with you all and um, looking forward to the conversation. So how did we get here? Why are we here today? Um, as Angela mentioned, she and I became curious about UDL and we wondered how it could be used in the studio environment to assist our learners. We hosted a workshop um, for faculty and we administered a survey to them to find out how they felt about UDL. And we learned that their initial attitudes pretty much mirrored national faculty attitudes. Um, that is that UDL only helps the student with accommodations, that it compromises rigor, and that it absolutely cannot be used in a studio class. When the COVID-19 pandemic began um, and faculty had to adjust to online teaching, we witnessed some really innovative shifts that supported UDL among our faculty. But as we began to return to the campus in 2021, um, attitudes have gradually re regressed. And Angela and I actually wrote about this experience for the New Directions in Learning publication led by Diana and Rob. And we just want to thank you again, Diana and Rob, for inviting us on this journey. So why do you, why UDL in this context? Well, we feel for one, there's no better place than an art school to create or innovate new learning designs. So we're all about that. Additionally, we think, and we know that UDL can help break down barriers, support diverse learning needs, it can benefit everyone, create more inclusive spaces, and still hold on to the rigor of the learning objectives. Plus, we get to be really creative about the pathways to those goals and objectives. Additionally, it supports retention. Okay, um, and this is just a visual image of the guidelines. This is from the CAST website. And um, it, it describes the main components of the comprehension guidelines. So the first is to activate or supply background knowledge, um, build connections to the students' prior understandings and experiences, highlight patterns, critical features, big ideas and relationships. Um, that is to accentuate important information and how it relates to the learning outcomes. Um, guide information processing and visualization. So we need to support the process of meaning making through models, scaffolds, feedback, and more. Um, and maximize transfer and generalization. Um, so to help the students apply their learning to new concepts or contexts. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about our first year experience program. Um, so our work as advisors, we frequently are collaborating with faculty to liaise, but also open up those lines of communications so that we all understand where the students are at, what those needs are. Um, at the College of Art and Design, the first year experience program includes the required curriculum. So it's a set of five courses, depending on each student's major. It includes drawing, photography and film labs, animation, illustration or design, as well as a survey course called Visual Culture Seminar and an English course. In addition, the advising team also provides weekly transition seminars to support students as they're acclimating to this new college environment. So in past years, we've given our first year students a copy of this book um, by Austin Cleon. It's called Steal Like an Artist. Um, it's a great book that you can pick up, you can flip through, there's lots of pictures and it shares guidance about perseverance, practice and process and finding yourself, AKA your artistic family tree, and also knowing what to sort of steal from other artists in a sense of honoring them and remixing it and make, making it your own. So we thought in the spirit of UDL, we wanted to invite you all to steal whatever you can from this, this um, experience and this presentation that you feel like could benefit and support your students. Oh, and also just, um, it's not just for artists. I would recommend yeah. this 
for anyone. It's just inspirational and provides motivation for whatever it is that you're doing. Okay, so who are our students? Um, we are, Leslie's a primarily white institution, um, though we have a multicultural and neurodiverse population of students. Um, our university is currently tuition dependent and therefore our acceptance rate is high. The major population of visual art and design undergraduates are traditional age college students and many are not prepared for the levels of independence that college requires. We have a strong representation of first-generation college students, and those are the students who are first in their families to attend college, so they don't have um, caregivers and relatives who can kind of help them navigate the world of college, which is so different from high school. Um, these students struggle with a hidden curriculum or the unwritten rules of academia. Um, and these can include really um, basic things to think about. Like in high school, you called your professor Mrs. Stanwood. Um, in college, I might ask you to call me professor. I might ask you to call me Julie. I might ask you to call me um, doctor, you know. So it's all of these sort of little pieces that college students have to have to figure out when they transition over. Um, and these students are also reticent to asking us for help when they're in a crisis situation, you know, until they're in a crisis situation. Um, the consulting group EAB, um, and you might know this group if you're in higher education, they're calling our first generation students Generation P. And Gen P comprises students whose high school experiences were negatively impacted and disrupted by the COVID-19 pandemic. And we, you know, we don't we don't want to stereotype these these um, generations, but we do see behaviors that support the idea of Gen P being underprepared both academically and mentally. And um finally, we should know that some of our students choose art school because parents or caregivers are putting pressure on them to choose what major they want to study they don't really know yet they're only 18 <laughs> but they had fun in their high school art class so why not art college sounds like a lot of fun um it's also a lot of work and many of them don't really um discover that until they're in their first semester and they're and they're struggling and the challenges of art school are real um just to sort of paint you a, a picture, uh, our studio classes are typically four and a half to six hours long. Much of that time could be spent standing at easels drawing or in studios or in dark rooms. Uh, supplies like portfolio cases and cameras often have to be carried around with students from class to class. Um, and access to things uh, like equipment like printers and labs that students need to, to complete their studio assignments require them to work outside of their dorm room. So they have to sort of manage their time in a way where they've got in-class time, but also work time in the studios. Um, it can also be very demanding to be creative on the spot or every single day. Um, and it's very common, especially in some of our design and illustration courses, for students to be asked to make multiple iterations of images based on a prompt. The uh, Leslie College of Art and Design logo, which you see on the right of this slide, is an example of some in-class work from one of our design workshop courses. So all of this requires, you know, some skills in managing time effectively, and also maintaining self-care independently without the immediate and direct support of a parent or a caregiver. Um, and our roles as, as advisors give us a lot of insight into how students are coping with some of these challenges and the transitions that are faced, the challenges that are faced, excuse me. So yeah, coming back to comprehension, uh, so when we think about comprehension, we want to think about what our students need to meet, meet the objectives of the learning experience. The four checkpoints that guide us in supporting comprehension are rooted in brain science and also readily handy for practitioners to put into action. 
So when we apply this to visual arts students, we think, well, they need to learn, practice, and know techniques and concepts of art. They need to be able to verbalize their processes, their ideas, their creative decisions, and they need to understand how their work fits in or not into the broader context of contemporary art. So on this journey today, we're going to um, explore some of the ways that comprehension takes shape and is supported by taking a look at one of our required first year courses called Visual Culture Seminar. So in this course, students complete weekly reading and writing assignments, exploring the topic of contemporary visual culture. So this area of study includes art, but also advertising, social media, and other visual expressions of, um, full disclosure, primarily Western culture. In time class is group discussion and debate, and students sit in a circle and they speak one at a time back and forth, and their participation points are based primarily on their ability to communicate in this type of learning setting. Okay, um, and for visual culture, cultural seminar, the learning objectives of the course are ambitious. And they include helping students think more critically about visual culture and its impact on society, um, providing students the skills to analyze and discuss their work in terms of form, content, and meaning, um, helping students develop sense of both visual acuity and visual literacy. Uh, helping them communicate their ideas more clearly and concisely, um, introducing them to a broad range of artistic methods and professional practices, and providing them with a more clearly defined sense of artistic community. So it's sort of about making the students understand what does it mean to be a professional artist and how do they, you know, how do I develop my, my artistic identity? Okay, so the syllabus, <clears throat> as you can see, we've sort of laid out, laid it out and taken an image. And you can see that it's very text heavy and ironically has no images. Um, it is single space formatting and is overall a fairly intimidating document for a first year college student. Um, and let me just say that with a caveat that this is a great class. Uh, many students are successful in it and report how the course content does, in fact, provide new awareness of visual art and design. We today are simply using it as a tool to assist us in identifying confusing and daunting academic norms um, and replacing them with more sort of student-oriented ways of community communicating and enhancing comprehension. Okay, so um, the course description, you know, the syllabus starts the course description. And the quote that I'm going to read is the first phrase in the course description, and it's used to set the stage for what this course is about. Um, it is a highly effective representation of what students will be learning, um, but the students really have to understand what it means. So the, the quote is, symbols matter. They say at a glimpse what words cannot, encapsulating beliefs, aspirations, prejudices, and fears. Having no intrinsic value, they take meaning from the way we use them, changing over time along with our actions. And that's by William C. Davis. Um, and I'm just going to give you a content warning um, about the next slide because it shows an image of the Confederate flag. And this image has and can be used in harmful ways, so please care for yourselves as needed. Okay, so um, in trying to invite the students to comprehend that first quote, consider adding um, context with an image so that students can visualize what is being expressed. So this this additional this additional text, um, Davis in parentheses, historian, author, 
Professor, use the Confederate flag as an example of a powerful symbol. Does it symbolize heritage or hate? This provides a bit of information about the author. Um, and the underlined phrase is a link to a brief interview with a museum curator who discusses how the meaning of the Confederate flag has changed depending on who's looking at it, when it was looked at, and how it is used. Um, and overall, adding images to the syllabus, especially a, sil a syllabus about visual culture, will remind students what the course is about and sort of why they're in art school. Okay. Um, so this slide shows part of the syllabus that discusses course, pro uh, course protocols. And I'm gonna give you just like a minute to skim it over. I was going to read it, but Angela and I decided that if I did start reading it, people would just walk away from their computers. And we didn't want that to happen. <laughs> Okay, and I do want to acknowledge that it's it would be more UDL for me to actually read this slide. Um, okay, so how can we improve comprehension here? Um, if you see highlighted in yellow, there are the same uh, metaphor is repeated twice. It is remember art school is not a spectator sport. And um, students might not um, relate to what is meant by a spectator sport. The same metaphor is also repeated twice. And if we must use multiple metaphors, let's use different ones to give students opportunities to understand. Um, some neurodivergents are not going to get metaphors at all. So it might be better to just sort of avoid them altogether. Um, how can we clarify and emphasize important points, such as those highlighted in, in blue? Are there ways to pull them out of a dense, heavy, a dense text heavy paragraph um, instead of just repeating the phrases? Uh, it might be easier for students if we focus on one topic at a time. In this case, it would be participation. Um, you can see highlighted in purple, there's a piece about attendance. And we should just move that sentence to the dedicated attendance section of the syllabus. Studies have shown um, that students respond better to conversational me and you style narrative versus um, sort of third person procedural cold type of voice, which is like highlighted in green. Students are expected to do this. Students are expected to do that. You know, students are and so on. It's better if I say, I expect you, you know, um, it just sounds a little bit more accessible. And, um, you know, we should also try to help our students understand the direct connections between their actions and how they will meet learning objectives. You know, how will participating in this course benefit them? Okay, so this is the after slide. And I'll give you a minute to just, just skim it. Julie? Yes. The original quote was directly from your syllabus, right? And the highlights were an analysis of places where you identified that you could make some uh, changes potentially, correct? That's right. That's correct. Right. Yeah. I just, because there's a, a question in the chat and I, you know, I'm imagining, uh, Tim, that that's what you were asking when you said pull quote. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that quote, that Davis quote was from a Wall Street Journal article from 2015. 
Okay, and then the quote on the, your syllabus, you're showing us from those sort of pictures that we could not really tell what was there. Uh, you're pulling quotes from the syllabus and you're doing an analysis of, well, I don't know if it's the right word, but anyways, you're doing an analysis of the narrative to see where you can um, uh, make changes that would better support students and understanding expectations and what. Um, exactly, yeah. Uh, right. So, so I'm looking specifically at instructions and Angela, Angela will look at assignments um, and yeah, we're just taking it directly from the syllabus. Great, thank you. Very okay. helpful. Um, and apologies if that wasn't clear earlier. Um, so if you look at the after slide, um, you can see that the instructions have been altered to sort of directly tie participation behaviors to learning outcomes. And this idea was expressed before, but it was kind of buried in other text. The overall tone is friendlier and highlights the why and how of participation. Um, and it includes an example um, that most students understand, you know, growing one's social media presence. And it invites them to sort of use the same energy toward participation in this course. Uh, the tense, the text is a little bit less dense um, without the single space formatting. Um, in the instructions, you know, these two paragraphs are dedicated solely to participation. Okay, and here's the other, here's another major policy, the attendance policy. Um, and I'll ask you to just take a minute to skim that. I, you know, I, I struck a few phrases out, but I think you can still see what they are. Okay, so I have a few suggestions for this um, for this piece, and one is you know similar to the participation section, and this is highlighted in green. You know, use that that um, speak directly to the student. Use kind of a you and me conversational voice. Um, the piece about the eighty percent of class meetings that's that's a little daunting, um, especially to art and design students um, who probably, they probably don't know the total number of classes that are, <laughs> that they're taking. They just know to go to class every week until the semester ends. So um, that sort of 80% is, it's not really giving them information that they can immediately take away. Um, I, I struck through the two lines because um, the, author of the syllabus sort of uh, presented the entire attendance policy for the college. So it was classes that meet once a week, cannot, absences cannot exceed three class meetings, courses that meet twice a week, absences cannot exceed six class meetings. Um, so my suggestion is to just stick to what is the absence policy for this particular course? Um, you know, we don't we don't want to give them too much information that doesn't necessarily apply to what they're reading. So this is the after version. Okay, and it sort of offers a, a friendlier tone. You know, it speaks to the student directly. It states the policy clearly in the, the bolded words. Um, it invites the students to connect with the instructor when unforeseen circumstances happen. There are several ways, places to hit the link to contact the instructor. Um, and sort of naming that sometimes unexpected events occur 
also takes the punitive nature out of the possibility of missing a class. So um, this is sort of this this is where college and high school can can differ. In high school, there are a lot of rules. In college, it's a space where we're inviting students to learn because they want to be here. And if they don't want to be here, then we want to help them find where they should be. Okay, and this is the grading um, policy for this course. And it's pretty simple. Participation slash attendance is 50% of the grade. Writing assignments is 50% of the grade. And then there's a, a sort of a descriptor of what each grade range might mean. So, um, so you can see participation and attendance comprise 50% of the student's grade. And this is actually meant to help students achieve success in the course, even if they're not skilled writers, because it's such a writing dependent course. So, um, you know, maybe add a little bit of clarification to the rubric, reminding them of the multiple ways that they can participate and include an option that allows students with social anxiety to participate, such as writing ideas on index cards and passing them to the instructor or using their smartphones, or just some, some sort of other means to communicate. And with the rubric for the writing assignments, a more structured table might limit confusion around what makes a paper worth a grade of A, B, et cetera. And also maybe links to a few exemplar assignments that students can see what it looks like to meet those expectations. And then um, finally, consider creating a voice thread or an audio version of course expectations that students can go back and listen to if they forget or need to hear the details again. Um, you know, I've heard students report that they'll ask instructors to clarify instructions and the instructor will say, well, go reread the syllabus. And that's not really helpful sometimes to students, um, especially a student with, with dyslexia or other sort of, um, you know, word processing um, challenges. So if the syllabus is meant to be the primary source of information, it has to be comprehensible to all of the students. Awesome. So now we'll talk a little bit about some strategies to optimize learning. Um, and I'll share a, a little bit of um, some stories just from my personal experience in teaching. Um, is that, I mean, I, I'll start with like, I always want to know who's in my room, who are my learners, who's entering that space and going on that trip with me to get to those learning objectives. Um, and I also want to share, like, for, you know, practitioners who might be a little bit new to UDL, um, it's helpful to remember that starting small and making adjustments and exploring things and trying things out is a good plan. And it can be pretty exciting to, to experiment and, and innovate in that way. So holding on and, like, carrying that question of what do my students need? What do our students need to get to the learning objectives? Um, is there a tool that we can design for self-assessment? How can we individualize the delivery? What are the tools of support? And then additionally, how can we open up and maintain those lines of communication so that students feel like they can approach us, that we are co-constructors and co-collaborators in the learning experience? Um, on the next slide, uh, here's a very basic example of a KWL chart. Um, KWL is an acronym standing in for what I know, what I want to know, and what I need or have learned. Um, so it's, as you can see, it can be pretty basic. You can cater it and individualize it based on your course content, but it's a great simple assessment tool to get students primed to think about, okay, what am I walking into this classroom knowing about visual culture or my ability and skills for reading and writing response papers or speaking in a group setting? what do I want to know or what do I need to learn um, is another great self-reflective prompt for students 
Um, I did write a little note right under up at the top. It says initial self-assessment and preparation for the final paper. So we know this is a fantastic course. Students are really into the content and it really is about is about them, about feeding their artistic progress and practice. And the final assignment is a reflective paper where they're asked to discuss their first semester in art school. So isn't it great to set them up to start thinking about their progress and monitoring their progress in this first semester by telling them, this is what's gonna come at the end. So let's keep track, let's keep notes, let's keep thinking about this as we continue on in the course. Um, so guideline three falls under the category of providing multiple means for representation. So the items here listed are a great starting point for thinking about the varied ways we can convey the what of the course and the learning. Julie took us through a few elements of the syllabus and we can see how by rephrasing and redesigning that document can be become more user friendly. It, it can become more of a guide for students. Um, I'd encourage you to think about exploring options to present materials in more than one format. So for example, in this course that we're sharing, all of the readings are provided as text, which can be downloaded as PDFs. But what if some of those texts were offered as audio recordings? So students could tune in and listen to the content um, rather than reading the written word, or maybe in addition to reading the, the written word. It's one idea. I know I can at times be more productive if I have, um, if I'm listening to something rather than reading it. There's also some incredible artists who create graphic narrative pieces that explore topics and questions related to visual culture. So what if there was an illustrated essay that was assi assigned one week in lieu of a text-based piece? I also like to begin class with an agenda and also like a general check-in and a couple minutes just to open it up with questions. And again, see how students are showing up in class, see where they're at. During group discussions, um, it's great to sort of keep, on, keep notes and keep monitoring the class discussion so that you can summarize and provide some key points somewhat in the way of like, in case you missed it, here are some big takeaways that I want you to, to jot down, you know, for your notes. And then when we're thinking about participation, because remember in this course, we've got 50% of that final grade is dependent upon participation. What if we thought about varying the social dynamic that could qualify as participation? So office hours with your professor, small group sessions with a teaching assistant where students talk about the content or the readings, online discussion posts through the course page. Maybe there's an in-class reading, writing, and public speaking workshop that they can participate in. So lots of different ways for students to demonstrate engagement with the content that goes beyond that individual speaking up in the group format setting, which can be very intimidating. Um, and it takes a lot of practice. Um, I think, yeah. So providing support. So back in, I think it was slide six, uh, Julie took us through the graphic organizer that CAST provides with the UDL guidelines. So a graphic organizer is essentially a, a visual tool to convey and present information. These can be great supports for note taking and writing assignments. A quick Google search will provide you with <laughs> thousands of options for graphic organizers. There are apps that you can download so you can have that handy on your phone or your device. Um, we took a look at a KWL chart earlier. Checklists. Um, I know when I, I taught this, this course at the grad level and I did provide checklists for grad students just to keep track of their work, which was really helpful. 
doodling. So this is a little, I, it perhaps it might be specific to art students, but hey, it might work for your students too. Uh, allowing doodling during class discussions can help some students tune into the conversation and listen more attentively. So I'm a big supporter of letting students sort of move their bodies if it helps with their uh, listening. And then we do have a group of peer mentors um, at Leslie. These are sophomore and junior students who have actually been through this first year course already. So they understand the experience. Connecting students with other students who've been through it can be uh, fantastic and really beneficial. Okay, the next slide, and I apologize for that. Looks like my formatting got a little uh, creative <laughs> up there, but inclusion and belonging. Um, I wanted to be sure to, to just share this with you all. When I begin my classes, um, especially a class like Visual Culture Seminar, which includes uh, something that might induce anxiety, being public speaking in a group setting, I like to share with, with students like, hey, once upon a time, when phones flipped open, <laughs> I was a student, <laughs> a freshman in a class just like this. I was excited to be in art school. I was terrified at the same time. And the idea of speaking up in class really shook my bones. And it's something even to this day that I have to work on. Just offering a little bit of self-disclosure or a little bit of your story can go a long way with building some trust and connection with students. They are so much more likely to connect with me either after, after class or in office hours to say, hey, I am really anxious about speaking up in class, you know, just so you know. So that's really, I found that to be really helpful, both with teaching, but also advising students. Um, and then, yeah, ind you know, individual meetings are very helpful. Supplemental sessions outside of the larger group discussion can be very helpful. Um, helping students get organized to form peer groups where maybe they can study or uh, review some of the content together. Uh, this next bullet, guest speakers to model the art discussions is one that I love, right? Like, what if we can bring in let's say upperclassmen or professional artists to come in and to talk about a topic from visual culture so that students can see and hear what that discussion looks like and feels like. Online exit, exit tickets are great. You can ask specifically if students felt like they were heard, if their perspectives were represented. And a big one is learning student names and pronouns that really does go a long way for inclusion and belonging. Okay, so um, now we're going to invite you to participate and asking you, um, what will you steal like an artist from this presentation? Or what strategies do you have that you invite us to steal? Um, I'm going to stop sharing the presentation. There we go. Um, it is, we have to, oh, more than 10 minutes. So I think we can move if, um, Carrie, are people able to unmute themselves if they want to um, raise their hand or raise a hand or give a shout out? <laughs> are we good? All right, so if you wanna ask your question out loud or put it in the chat, um, and I'm gonna start the conversation because I was anxious to do this the whole time when you were talking about the syllabus. Have you looked at using uh, generative AI to help you um, make that user-friendly? I know I've used it a lot in many of the um, podcasts I listen to. This is it's just incredibly helpful. So my, a question to you that I would offer if you haven't done it is to use uh, generative AI. I don't know if you've tried that, but to actually put those sections in and ask AI, um, I kind of, I use like write this for a fifth grader sometimes uh, to get it down to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. To get it to a simple uh, and it's worked beautifully. And um, so that would be a, uh, 
a question I have for you and that I that you can steal from me and then I've I don't know I, who I stole it from but <laughs> I'm a big fan so that would be one suggestion I um, steal that <laughs> yeah so in the chat we have um uh we like the idea of the KWL chart which are wonderful for 101 reasons we use those a lot when we do training on UDL there's a book recommended here when hope and fear collide uh, it talks about the hopes and fears of starting college. Um, we have go back through the syllabus and make them more clear, personable, and approachable. Yeah, that's that's a huge um, a huge issue. We have these very and just you know I'm going to say academically uh, very academicy syllabi. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, then we have uh, plain language. Uh, you know, what's another way to talk about playing language? Uh, adding the accessibility statement. Um, graphic org organizers to uh, guide note taking. Absolutely. Uh, flexible grouping is another one. Um, then Christopher here said, I think maximize is a big one, so I'm going to read it. Maximizing the human element to increase comprehension was emphasized really well. Um, and this is jumping on me, I apologize. Being open to communicating to students to clarify, peer mentors, in, ensuring multiple means yeah. to represent expectations, uh, verbal explanation, audio recordings, um, uh, would, and written instructions, working time on projects, using class time to work on uh, projects, uh, using mind mapping app for showing a student how a course outcomes align with the module outcomes. And, and that was stolen. So stolen, and now we're giving it away. Uh, is to say, Professor Deb adds that you don't need to have formal accom accommodations to get support mm -hmm. from me. Let's chat about that. Wow, that's powerful. Very yeah. powerful. Anybody else want to uh, speak out or um, continue to add? Um, we have a lot of people still in this Zoom room. Um, anybody else? Other, uh, let's see, did something else just roll up? No. Uh, also share research on the benefits of concept mapping. Yeah, so letting students know why this is beneficial. So not just, so being very intentional, not just saying here's something you can do, but actually say here's why it matters mm -hmm. and why you should do it. Um, if I got that right, uh, Sarah. And, um, uh, so we see here, uh, we've been using generative AI to add UDL. Yes, absolutely. And there's a link here. Um, nice. yeah. You want to grab that link, people? Um, and then a uh, question I had for the presenters. Um, I'm really excited about this. And because I just discovered I like to do art, it's fairly Yeah, yeah so it's fine. So, you know, you mentioned a lot of writing. Um, do you have alternative ways for students to um, submit those response papers besides writing, like drawing, painting, uh, photographs, and other things? So that's a question. We use that. Um, yeah. 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 It's an idea that I love. Um, and this, so this, this course is incredibly popular based on the content that's covered like students can't wait to sink their, their to talk about the content but the structures remain the same for 15 to 20 years so we're still asking for writing assignments but i love the idea of uh students presenting a comic or a graphic essay or a, a photo series or a film or a video absolutely an animation um so yeah. so yeah, I'm all with you. I can tell just from your background, Diana, you've got you've got the interest there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we're doing that with fa with faculty, and it does. Um, you people need to be. Rob, do you want to jump in? People need to be. I don't want to say retaught how to respond in other ways. Like as a little kid, we might draw the picture, right. but how yeah, to, yeah, to bring that back. Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. and with online, you know, drawing something or creating something, then taking a picture of it and then posting it, you know, mm -hmm. on a platform or Padlet or in the discussion board. 
and then captioning it, you know, so providing those options or creating yeah. a video and infographic, but you have to teach, you know, you have to be explicit and teach the students also how to do that. So, you know, the, it's not barriers for them. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I think one of the benefits of this, uh, I mean, particularly for a younger generation of students and I'll, speak in my experience in my photography classes, sometimes students would come in and they'd have these tips and tricks with Photoshop that I'd never heard of. Um, you know, they'd be able to create content pretty quickly. So yeah, I think, I think that's a great, great idea. So a uh, book, uh, and I have this book, so the great suggestion, thank you, Michelle. Uh, a, also a good read is Academic Ableism by J. Uh, T. Tomage. And there's, um, a link to the book in the chat uh, if people didn't grab it. Um, yeah. Okay. And Chris oh, has his hand up. Well, uh, okay, I can't see Chris. Chris, there you yeah, are. Yeah, yeah. I go by Christopher, by the way. Oh, okay. Christopher, sorry. <laughs> That's all good. Um, I'm, I'm really intrigued by the comment about uh, students will not always get metaphors. And I think that's a super important thing to keep in mind because <laughs> some of us use metaphors a little too much, probably, <laughs> myself included, probably. Um, but there's an interesting relationship there. I'm curious to your thoughts to things like using story or in, the, in your case, using visuals, using art to emphasize a concept that might be more complicated. And I'm curious about that relationship, like the metaphor, it's almost like uh, the hidden curriculum, right? There, there's this encoded message that's, that's said a lot and lived a lot, but people don't always explain it. And maybe is the difference then with, with story, with narrative, with using visual arts is it is kind of a narrated um, way of helping students comprehend something more complex. Curious to your thoughts on that. Um, yeah. Um, and I think the idea is to use uh, multiple means of access. Um, metaphors in particular, um, some of my advisees identify as members of the um, autism community. And, you know, if I say that, well, art school is not a spectator sport, um, they might say, what are you talking about? And if, but if I say um, it's important for you to participate in the class so that you gain all those skills that are listed in the learning outcomes, okay, you know, that's to just be be clear. Say, you know, tell the students what they, um, you know, state the instructions ex explicitly. But I think I think it's really effective to use storytelling and images and other other means of communication with students. Just sort of don't don't just rely on metaphors. That's just my suggestion. Yeah, and there's quite a bit in the um, chat here. Uh, Sarah Silverman mentioned uh, international students and that this is important. Also, um, as someone wrote about idioms too, using idioms. Okay. And I know um, some people in this uh, Zoom room teach uh, individuals who were English as their, uh, their English language learners or English as, a, you know, U.S. English is a second language. Um, the other thing about storytelling is, um, and I'm probably going to mess up the name. The last name is w Willingham, um, and he's a cognit cognitive psychologist. I'm trying to find the book really quickly. Um, and he, he has a chapter. This was just on the pod network, um, the professional development network website. Um, I mean, listserv talking about, I'm trying, sorry, I'm trying to find the book. Um, and talking about the name of the book is outsmart your brain, why learning is hard and how you can make it easy. Um, and he gives a lot of really good suggestions there that align with universal design for learning. And Rob, I don't know if you could put that in the chat. Um, yeah, Daniel Willingham, great website. And um, in the book, Why Don't Students Like School? Um, I believe it's the third chapter there. He specifically addresses the importance of storytelling mm -hmm. and using stories to support students and making connections and explains, again, the science behind that, um, which I think is what's wonderful yeah. about EPL and the work that we're trying to do. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So Rob put it in there and then... Um, 
Yeah. So, oh. all right. Other comments or questions? This is an amazing conversation to have with people all over. Uh, we will be posting this on the uh, YouTube. And Rob, can you just pop in the YouTube link? Um, yeah. yeah. So we have a playlist. Um, we also have a Padlet, which is a bulletin board, if you're not familiar with it. Another great place to um, have students share information. And um, I want to, so those two links will go in the chat. And it'll be about a week to two weeks um, when this will be available. Um, and we really appreciate everybody uh, coming today. And we want to thank our presenters. It's just so fun. Uh, to have colleagues around the country that we can pull together and bring this kind of information forward. So we really appreciate the participation and thank everybody for coming today. Any last words from our presenters? Just thank you all for, for listening and for for sharing your strategies. I, I have a whole list that I'm stealing from y'all. Great. <laughs> yeah, I'd say go for it. Do it. Yeah. Get creative. Uh, All right. Back. All right. Very good. Thanks, everybody. And um, we look forward to the next uh, session, which is coming up in uh, late April. Uh, so stay tuned for uh, number four.